what is known as Warren State Hospital was not always the obscure, unassuming college looking campus many Pennsylvania residents drive by thoughtlessly on their way down Route 62 into the city of Warren. Originally built on a 330-acre parcel of land, Warren State Hospital was first opened in 1880, at which time it was named simply Hospital for the Insane. In 1927, the name was changed to the less conspicuous Warren State Hospital. Although construction did not finish until 1882, Warren State Hospital took its first patients in 1880. At the end of the first year, it is reported that there were 46 male patients and 179 women. Cost per patient was $3 to $10 per week in 1880 dollars, which when adjusted for inflation is 87 to 290 in 2021 dollars. Some of the reasons cited for the initial admissions include the general themes of mania, dementia, addiction, and brain trauma. Some more unusual reasons cited include excitement, jealousy, menstrual disorder, overjoy, religious excitement, worry, excessive use of tobacco, and menopause. According to the Warren County Historical Society, alcoholism was by and large the biggest customer. Warren State Hospital grew continually during its history prior to national deinstitutionalism. Warren State Hospital in its prime time was a self-sufficient colony featuring its own steam power plant, quarters for all employees, its own kitchen, laundry, theater, church, as well as all the facilities dedicated to patient care. Warren State Hospital featured both facilities for men as well as a development dedicated to quote, emotionally disturbed women. Both the men and women's quarters were equipped with Turkish baths, which you might also know as a steam room. Activities for the patients were plentiful and diverse. Patients of both sex engaged in regular PT sessions weekly dances to live music, theatrical productions in their state-of-the-art auditorium, as well as agrarian pursuits in a farm colony located on a separate plot of land and in their on-campus greenhouse. At the height of the asylum's history, it housed over 2,500 people. Today, following much controversy and a general change in legislature in regards to mental health, that number has shrunk to merely 200 of the most severely afflicted. It is also noted that there is the addition of dual chain link fences equipped with razor wire as many mental health patients are now placed on the basis of court adjudication or insanity pleas to criminal charges. In the 1920s, with the help of patient labor, Warren State Hospital installed underground tunnels in between the main building and the stone building, which in some sources is described as a place where acute cases were housed. I was unable to find any pictures or video of these tunnels in my search, and it is unknown what purpose they serve today. These tunnels are also not shown on the map of the campus today, as you can see. I noted that although the greenhouse described in Warren State history still stands, it appears to be devoid of any plant life. In today's technological age, it's nearly impossible to go anywhere in public and not be under some form of surveillance. During most of its 240-year history, however, Warren State Hospital was not. Although there were several incidents of abuse and mistreatment reported, and several which led to criminal charges against employees, it's likely there were far more which never left the asylum's walls. Communicating complaint was a much more arduous task before the internet ages instant connectivity, especially in a self-contained and self-sufficient campus which even had its own cemetery. A search of internet archives reveal several controversies which did manage to make it outside the asylum walls. In 1910, two nurses were charged criminally for the assault of a 100-pound girl named in court documents as a Miss Rice. Ms. Rice was reported to have been a patient not on the basis of mental health, but simply a paid resident by her parents who initially blew the whistle on her mistreatment. However, it is relevant to consider the stigma around having a mentally ill child in the early 1900s, and many families may have made similar claims. The nurses were of alleged to have choked Ms. Rice until her face darkened, and then later in the day snuck back into Ms. Rice's quarters. The nurse then proceeded to secure her arms and cloth wrist restraints on her bed while the other held her legs. The 
duo went on to give her a particularly brutal dose of what was known as the soap treatment. This soap treatment was where a soapy cloth was held tightly over the patient's mouth and nose until the patient was forced to breathe in and choke on the soap suds. Five nurses testified on behalf of Ms. Rice, corroborating her story of abuse and mistreatment. The nurses testified that upon visiting Ms. Rice, they noted her nose and mouth were irritated and inflamed and suds dripped out of them. The five nurses who came to Ms. Rice's aid in court were subsequently fired by the hospital without cause. In 1928, hospital orderly Herbert Johnson was charged in Warren County courts with murder following the death of a patient. It is said that the victim was highly disturbed, having attempted to jump through a window on a prior occasion. He had to be continually sedated and restrained by orderlies in order to dissuade this behavior. Other orderlies testified that Johnson had restrained the male by wrapping a towel around his neck and twisting it. The male was discovered the following morning deceased with bruising and abrasions to his neck. I was unable to locate a final disposition for the orderly's court case. These, as well as other publicized incidents at asylums across the country, eventually led to the deinstitutionalization of many hospitals in the late 20th century. This process involved the release of many patients with the promise of more humane care through the use of in home care, halfway houses, and clinics. The reality is, though, that this may have been an even larger failure in care as we have since seen mentally afflicted and addicted homeless populations explode across America. Fearing the mistreatment of mentally ill patients in hospitals, we have turned them to the streets of America where they sleep on sidewalks and under overpasses. Many of the Warren State Hospital's multitude of buildings were demolished in the 1980s as a result of the drop in patient admission, reductions in staff, and disuse of the facilities. Not all patients were released during this process, however, as they were deemed too large of a danger. One such man is George Keith of Clearfield County. After being found criminally insane following the murder of a 12-year-old Phillipsburg girl, Keith had been placed as an inmate in Warren State Hospital in 1992. On December 21, 1999, Keith was given permission to walk around the hospital grounds, which had no gate, with the strict direction not to leave hospital grounds. Keith never returned from this walk, and despite several agencies' attempts to locate him in the blizzard conditions, was never found. Keith had been a veteran of the Vietnam War, and on a night in 1975 had crossed paths with a 12-year-old girl in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. Keith had been drinking at a local bar, but had stepped out when he began hearing voices. When he crossed paths with 12-year-old Tracy Stetler, he took the raspberry soda she was carrying for an improvised explosive device in her jeans and sneakers as that of a Viet Cong operative's uniform. He dragged her into the woods near his parents' house, brutally murdered her, and shortly thereafter fled to Mexico where he was later extradited and tried for the murder. After a lengthy trial for the murder, he was found not guilty on the basis of insanity and placed in the state hospital. Since his unextraordinary escape from Warren State Hospital, he has not been seen in the 23 years since and is still a wanted fugitive by the U.S. Marshal Service.